This talk is a much abbreviated version of a paper with the same title. The writing of my latest and probably last book has reminded me of just how much I do owe to those expert colleagues from other disciplines who have contributed so much to my own understanding. I unashamedly make here the case for collaborative interdisciplinary work in the field of early music and voice. Those who know me will probably not be surprised if I begin with a picture of a steam engine. We are looking at a reproduction of the very first railway locomotive, Richard Trevithick's Penny Darren Ironworks engine of 1804. It was built from Trevithick's original documents and plans which have been found. So there are clearly thrilling possibilities in any field whenever the right documents can be got hold of. Problems arise with this painting. It's by Terence Cuneo. Cuneo lived from 1907 to 1996, so it's a work of imagination. But there is one rather important detail that is probably correct. The driver is not riding on the engine, but leading it like a horse. The driving trailer here is a work of fiction, considered a necessary modern safety addition, and there are many other technical requirements that make this ver visually impressive reproduction rather different from the original. I won't bore you with them here. My point is that they do things differently in the foreign country that is the past. The performance practice was that of the horses that had previously pulled the wagons. Here, the BBC costume department has done a splendid job. I wonder how many choirs might like to dress like Handelians. Fun for the boys, no doubt. But educational? What I wonder would be the producer's excuse for spreading what is very probably misinformation about Handel's performance practice. Does it matter? Perhaps I am a pedant, but it troubles me when historical film and TV drama gets the train so badly wrong, as it almost invariably does. Well, I know about trains. What about all the other things I don't know about? Details, details, details. Here's something that bothers me in recent choral history. English cathedral choirs differ from European ones in that boys usually only ever sing the top part, whereas in the European tradition we find older boys and young men on the lower parts. I wonder is that why now young adolescent girls sing where we might otherwise expect adult sopranos. Photographs dating from the earlier 20th century appear to suggest that this is a recent development, not a long-standing tradition. Now we don't know the parts these boys and young men sang, but a reasonable guess would be the boy with the cap was a treble and the two young men were perhaps either tenor or bass. Actually, I'm afraid I told a lie. We do know the parts they sang. They were all soprano. The past, remember, is a foreign country. But please don't try to tell me that puberty did not come until age 18, or that Donald Simpson did not speak with a young man's broken voice. If we think otherwise, we run into difficulty. Clint van der Linde recorded Bach's Cantata 51 at the age of 15 and a half. Are we to assume, as Stephen Dorr appears to, that this is an unbroken voice, the voice of a child? Dorr appears to be one of the main sources of the popular and persistent belief that puberty did not come until the age of 17 or 18 in the time of Bach. 
a particularly valuable collaboration with was with Dr. Anne Christine Mech of Leipzig. Anne Christine's doctoral work had been on voice change in musical history, with a particular focus on Bach. She has also worked with, acoustici uh, with acoustician Johann Sundberg on the difference between boys' and girls' voices, so is no stranger to collaboration. The work we did together backed my intuition that puberty in Bach's day could not possibly have been as late as Dorr imagined. I'm now quoting myself here. My forthcoming new book owes a huge particular debt to professors Gary Butler and David Howard. Gary is a paediatric endocrinologist who was able to answer all my many questions about the details of male puberty. Together with David Howard, we were able then to carry out clinical work on the relationship between testicular volume, which is the definitive medical measurement of puberty, and voice that would have been impossible for a non-medical specialist. So it's given me the data and the confidence to question some of the statements made by musicologists without the benefit of expert medical help. Dr Ginevra Williams is well known for her work on vocal health in singing, which was informed by groundbreaking doctoral work on the boy choristers of a well-known London cathedral. It is through work with Ginevra and with David that the Boys Keep Singing project and subsequent OUP Emerging Voices choral series developed. But Ginevra and those who agree with her, not least Dr Michael Fuchs of Leipzig's Tamana Corps, would have boys stop singing treble almost as soon as they begin puberty. This potentially brings modern and historical practice into conflict. During 2017, I spent a highly productive residency at Trinity College Dublin with Dr Andrew Johnston. Andrew has worked closely with the Early English Organ Project and is the main source of my confidence that David Woolston got it completely wrong when he imagined Renaissance boys with stratospherically high voices. They never existed. Yet there are still choirs that attempt to replicate them with high sopranos. Though I gave a lecture to the boys in Andrew's choir, I didn't have the opportunity to measure or vocally examine any of them, and I left wondering what kind of boy could have descended effectively as low as a modern E3 in this mean part from the Lamb Magnificat of 1500. So at this point I feel the need for the help of bioarchaeology. A promising painstaking study based upon 994 adolescent skeletons excavated from three sites was published in 2020 by Mary Lewis, Fiona Shapland and Rebecca Watts. The headline finding was that puberty began in medieval times approximately between the ages of 10 and 12, much as it does now. However, progress through puberty was slower, full adult status not being achieved in some cases until as late as age 21. It is tempting from this to jump to immediate conclusions as a result. Unfortunately, some musicologists have done this without examining the detail or perhaps collaboratively working with other disciplines. This chart shows a breakdown of skeletal maturity ages for the Barton-upon-Humber site. The green colour representing peak height velocity is what interests us most. It is during peak height velocity, that is to say, when the boy is growing fastest, that most voices break 
and I do use the term break intentionally rather than change. We appear to have some suggestions of a bimodal distribution here. Some boys may have left choirs at around age 15 to perhaps 16, but others would appear to have experienced a voice break rather earlier, some as young as age 11. The mean or medius voice has for some time been my principal interest. But who were these boys? I'm afraid you need more than a nice costume to turn a boy into a mean. There is a hugely unfortunate tendency amongst some writers to take an anecdote such as Haydn's voice broke at 17, which incidentally isn't true, and treat that as though it were a mean value that somehow tells us when all voices broke. The table shows the mean age at which boys in my own longitudinal study reached peak height velocity. It was 13 years and 7 months. But what counts is not this, but the range. One boy got to this stage at age 11, whilst another had passed age 15. At the very least, this means that there must be a considerable overlap between 16th century and modern boys, and that's true indeed for all singers' heights. A tall 16th century singer would actually be taller than a short 21st century singer, and the same would be true about boys' ages at peak height velocity. We know the parts these boys in this 1560 portrait were singing. The boy on the left has a Josquin part book, and it's a Bassus part. We do know his age. The ages are recorded in the painting. He was 13. Kerry McCarthy understandably wonders whether he could actually have managed a bass part. If we take the work of Lewis and her colleagues at face value, the answer is yes, he probably could. The dark green bar on the bottom of the lower chart shows the range of peak height velocity found in that study, and it extends to boys as young as 13. And by the same token, in the upper chart, look at the bars from my own study of 21st century boys. The ranges for pre-peak height velocity extend as far as age 15. George Thalbon Ball had little time for low-pressure baroque-voiced organs and was not averse to the swell pedal in bark. His approach to training boys was similarly grounded in earlier methods that have long been out of favour since the days of George Malcolm and Benjamin Britten. And the simple message is that what has changed most is vocal pedagogy, not the size or shape of singers. So we need to look much more at what we know about how singing was taught in earlier days.